Happy Thursday morning to you all, and welcome to another episode of Frankly Speaking Sports. I'm your host, Larry Frank, and I'm so very happy to have you with us today. We have a lot to get to, and we get to start off the show even before anything with breaking news out of the NFL that the NFL has just sent a memo out to all 32 teams saying that as of tomorrow, June 5th, all coaching staffs will be allowed to enter their team facilities. So big, big, big news out of the NFL in regards to coaches, which is great news. That just means we'll get him back more and more to normalcy in the NFL. Also, a little bit later today, probably by the time you hear this show, the NBA will be having a vote to ratify the season Um, It looks like the vote will be overwhelming, yes, that the season will start on July 31st and go through October. And as we get more information, I believe uh, 1230 Eastern Standard Time is that conference call with all the NBA officials, and that announcement will come down As it comes down, we will go ahead and get you more information on that. So some great, great news out of the NBA, some great, great news out of the NFL. And later on in the show, we're going to have Alex Gleitman on. Alex is uh, an insider for Buckeye Scoop. He He covers Ohio State University as well as Rutgers University. So we'll get to talk to him about a little bit of college football opening up, what to expect. We'll talk some Ohio State football as well. So lots and lots to get to. And we start with another unfortunate situation. And it just seems like the last couple of days, you know, we've been talking about some issues that, uh, you know, unfortunately are happening. And I think that's the best way to put it. But it happened again yesterday with just an outpour on social media. Just incredible amount of outpour about the comments that Drew Brees made um, in regards to people kneeling for the national anthem. And, you know, we're going to go ahead and let you listen to that audio. I believe we have it of his comments. Why don't we go ahead, do that first. And then we'll make some comments on the remarks and hear from some other people, as well as Malcolm Jenkins, who is a player with Drew Brees. So let's go ahead and roll that tape of Drew Brees first. Here we go. Let's get that right now for you. Reality. And now it's coming back to the fore, and a lot of people expect that we will see players kneeling again even when the NFL season starts. I'm curious how you think the NFL will and should respond to that. And, of course, you're such a leader in the league. Uh, What is your responsibility as a leader uh, in times like this for the rest of your teammates and, and players in the league? Well, I, I will. I will never agree with anybody um, disrespecting the flag of the United States of America or our country. Um, let me let me just tell you what I see or what I feel when the national anthem is played, and when I look at the the flag of the United States, I envision my two grandfathers who fought for this country during World War II, one in the Army and one in the Marine Corps, both risking their lives to protect our country and to try to make our country and this world a better place. So every time I stand with my hand over my heart, looking at that flag and singing the national anthem, that's what I think about. And in many cases, it brings me to tears, thinking about all that has been sacrificed, not just those in the military, but for that matter, those throughout the civil rights movements of the 60s. And everyone, and all that has been endured by so many people up until this point. And is everything right with our country right now? No, it's not. We still have a long way to go. But I think what you do by standing there and showing respect to the flag with your hand over your heart is it shows unity. It shows that we are all in this together. We can all do better. And that we are all part of the solution. 
And that was uh, Drew Brees uh, from the New Orleans Saints. And you listen to that, and I think, you know, the big part that got me is I can never agree with someone who is kneeling during the national anthem. I think something similar to those words is what he said. And at a time where, you know, people are very, very sensitive, he was basically saying that the way it was taken was, I can't listen to what anybody has to say. I can't agree with any message when it comes to kneeling to the national anthem. Now, whether it was meant that way or not, that's the way it was perceived. And, you know, you really got to watch out with your words. You know, people are looking for leaders to lead during this time. And, you know, there's a lot better way of saying that he does not like people kneeling for the national anthem than saying, I can't agree. You know, this was a platform. You know, when the players and Colin Kaepernick did this, it wasn't about the flag. And that's where I think Drew was missing the point. It never had to do about the flag. It never had to do about respect or disrespect for the military. It had to do about racism. The message was clearly about racism, racism in the United States of America and the entire world. And by making those comments, a lot of people took it as Drew not understanding the message, actually missing the message altogether. And Malcolm Jenkins really had a, a very emotional uh, comment back to Drew Brees. Yeah, I promise you this. The onslaught of shit that we have to deal with is fucking crazy right now. Drew Brees, if you don't understand how hurtful, how insensitive your comments are, you are part of the problem. To think that because your grandfather's served in this country and you have a great respect for the flag that everybody else should have the same ideals and and, and, and thoughts that you do is ridiculous and it shows that you don't know history because when our grandfathers fought in, for this country and served and they came back they didn't come back to a hero's welcome they came back and got attacked uniforms they came back to people to racism to complete violence and then here we are in 2020 with the whole country on fire everybody witnessing a black man dying at the hand being murdered at the hands of the police with his just in cold blood for everybody to see the whole country's on fire and the first thing that you do is criticize one's peaceful protest that was years ago when we were trying to signal a uh, 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 sign for help and signal for our allies and our white brothers and sisters, the people we considered to be friends, to get involved. It was ignored. And here we are now with the world on fire and you still continue to first criticize how we peacefully, pro how we peacefully protest because it doesn't fit in what you do and your beliefs without ever acknowledging that a fact that the man was murdered at the hands of police in front of us all and that it has been continuing for centuries. That the same brothers that you break the huddle down with before every single game, the same guys that you bleed with and go on a battle with every single day, go home to communities that have been decimated Drew, unfortunately unfortunately you're somebody who doesn't understand their privilege you don't understand the potential that you have to actually be an advocate for the people that you call brothers you don't understand the history and why people like me, people with my skin color, whose grandfather fought for this country, who served, and I still protested against that, against the, not against the national anthem, but against what was happening in America and what our, the fabric of this country is for.
or stands for, if you don't understand that other people experience something totally different than you, then when you talk about being the brotherhood and all this other bullshit, it's just lip service or it's only on the field. Because when we step off of this field and I take my helmet off and I'm a black man walking around America and I'm telling you I'm dealing with these things, I'm telling you my communities are dealing with these things, and your response to me is, don't talk about that here. This is not the place. Where's the place, Drew? I'm disappointed. I'm hurt. Because while the world tells you that you're not worthy, that your life doesn't matter, the last place you want to hear from are the guys that you that you go to war with and that you con- consider to be allies and to be your friends. Even though we're teammates, I can't let this slide. That was Malcolm Jenkins. He's the safety for the New Orleans Saints, a teammate of Drew Brees. And you could just hear the emotion in that entire segment um, from him, just how upset he is and how, you know, Drew Brees has just misunderstood the whole point here, according to Malcolm Jenkins. And... You know, it's it's going to be a tough situation right now in New Orleans. I mean, those guys are going to have to sit down and work this out because right now there's a lot of lot of uh, misunderstanding uh, going on there, or maybe it's not misunderstanding. Maybe Malcolm is a hundred percent correct. You know, I'm not here to take any sides. I'm just saying here that. You know, Drew Brees' comments were very, very insensitive. There is no doubt about that. And he's got a lot of making up to do and talking to a lot of these players on his team right now when they get into camp. We'll be back right after this. Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Hey, how often you heard me speak about the word passion? And I'm going to speak about it again because I believe in it so much. And the people I have known in life who are successes in whatever they've done, whether it be the corporate world, whether it be law, medicine, they've all had the passion, not just in athletics, but in whatever they've done in life. If you don't have passion, how in the world can you be a success? You've got to feel it and believe it. I always tell young people, find something you love to do. You come out of college, find that area that you really, really are excited about. And don't let anybody chase you away from it. You believe in it, feel it, think it, do it. And the bottom line is have that passion. Have that passion of pride that is so vital in being a success. What makes all the great, great players that we look over the years, whether it be a Derek Jeter or Tom Brady or LeBron James, all the great ones, they have such a sense of passion to be better today. Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Frankly Speaking Sports, it is my great honor, pleasure, and thrill to have with us today on the Frankly Speaking Sports Hotline. He covers Ohio State um, at Buckeye Scoop. Let's please welcome Alex Gleitman. Alex, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for, thanks for coming on. I know you're real busy today. Hey, you know, I just heard yesterday, and what, what timing to have you on right after this announcement comes down, that the Ohio State president, I believe it's Michael Drake, announced that Ohio State, they're moving forward uh, as far as they are planning with the uh, 2020 football season, and that's with fans in the stands. Are you surprised that he came out with that comment yesterday? No, I'm not surprised. I think they were waiting for kind of that final piece of the puzzle, which is our students going to be on campus before they decided to move forward with the plan to play football. And, uh, you know, they announced yesterday that uh, the semester would be starting in late August with students on campus. 
Uh, it would be an abbreviated semester on campus to some extent, so students will just go home after Thanksgiving and finish their classes and take their finals from home. But uh, I think once that was kind of figured out and announced, it's no surprise to hear that Ohio State football will be back this year uh, in some capacity. We don't know if it's going to be the schedule played as planned, but it does seem that anywhere between twenty to 50,000 fans will be in the horseshoe every Saturday when there's a home game. So uh, I guess, you know, if you're a fan of the Buckeyes or college football in general, that's certainly great news to hear. Yeah, and you know, you just mentioned what I was about to say was that stadium sits a hundred, you know, at full capacity, roughly a hundred thousand people. So even with some of these, uh, you know, rules in place where they're only allowed to fill to a certain percentage, they still could have, like you said, twenty-five to fifty thousand fans still rocking that stadium. Yeah, they haven't announced what the plans are exactly yet. They said that they're expecting fans to be in there, uh, social distancing and all necessary precautions taken. And so there will be some spacing out and things of that nature. I'm sure fans will be required to wear masks. But uh, the numbers we've heard is, you know, it seems like on the low end, 20,000, on the high end, 50,000. And I know, obviously, <laughs> certainly when, when there's that much money involved, uh, they're going to be pushing toward 50,000 if, if they can make that happen. Yeah, and, you know, it's amazing how much, and you and I both know it, you're, you're you know, I, I used to live in Gainesville, Florida for a couple of years where the Florida Gate is a big time college football in the SEC, and you're in the Big Ten with big time Ohio State. You know, without those fans in the stands, we're talking about billions of dollars in revenue that these colleges would lose and I know in my opinion and I, I want to get yours I can't see you know any of these big schools going without fans yeah I mean I think every situation is different you know when you talk about a Rutgers which is kind of in the heat of things in the New York New Jersey and you know the NYC metro area obviously the situation is a lot different than it is for the Idaho Vandals, for example, right? So I think every situation is going to have to be looked at differently. Um, but I, I do think for the for the majority of teams that are playing, if not all the teams that are actually playing, uh, that there will be fans in the stands. And you have to remember, it's not just this money funding the those specific teams or the athletic departments in general. It's funding the whole university. I mean, athletic money goes toward paying for libraries and paying for equipment and paying you know, for staff and things like that. And especially at a place like Ohio State where uh, they've already, you know, think about this. They, the revenue losses they're predicting is $300 million because of the pandemic. And that's a, I mean, that's a lot of money um, right there. And so if you take out, you know, as you said, millions and millions more, it, it, it only cuts into that. And, and again, not only affects athletics, but affects the entire university as a whole and some of the things that they're trying to do for the non-athletic student body. Now, as a fan and as a uh, person that uh, reports, you know, and covers both, I think you cover Rutgers as well, correct? That's correct, yeah. Right. So for someone that covers two big schools, let's take it from a fan's perspective. Would you feel comfortable going to a game at that 25% or 50% capacity? Uh, for me personally, I don't know if I would. I, I have a young uh, son. He's, you know, uh, not even a year and a half uh, yet. Um, he will be by the time the season starts. I have uh, another son on the way. Um, my wife's pregnant, so... Uh, and then, you know, I, I have family members that are, that are high risk and, you know, grandparents and things like that. And if I want to see them, I don't know if I potentially put myself in that situation, but that's, that's my opinion. I think with this whole thing, everyone has to make their own opinions on what they're comfortable with and what their situations are, and I think, you know, the biggest thing is just respecting that, whether you agree with it or not, or whether you do it or not. I think as long as everyone respects, you know, just th th this whole process and, and what everyone wants to do, then that's fine. You know, there's, there's for Ohio State, I know there's definitely going to be 50,000 people that are going to be willing and, and comfortable going to a game every Saturday, but... You know, there's going to be a lot of people that aren't as well. And, and so those people can stay home and watch on their couches. And, you know, that's that's probably what I'm going to be doing. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, I think there's a lot that can change between now and September. And so my feelings might change by then. But right now, for my particular situation, I don't know if I would feel comfortable 
doing that. Um, and we, we don't even know the guidelines yet. So I think there's a lot of factors involved, but I think everyone has a personal decision to make on their own um, situation. We are talking to Alex Gleetman. Uh, he covers Ohio State and Rutgers University. He's on the Frankly Speaking Sports hotline. Um, this Monday, I believe it's this Monday, uh, college campuses are opening up their facilities now for, um, you know, the athletes to come on campus, to work out, to use the facilities. So it looks like, you know, things are starting to get back to normal, aren't they, as far as the 2020 season goes? Yeah, again, you know, every state is different. Every school is different, private, public, uh, by state. So, you know, somebody like Rutgers, they're not they're not going to be open next week. I think they're eyeing the week of June 22nd, but I know Ohio State is, is going to be open and starting voluntary workouts next week. Uh, there's a few other programs across the country that are going to be in the same boat. Uh, but I, I will say from, from athletes I've spoken to, just understanding the process, it seems like there will be some sort of testing uh, early next week for a lot of these schools. Mm-hmm. Um, before athletes can participate in those workouts. So it's good to see that schools are taking precautions. Obviously, if someone uh, tests positive uh, for the for the COVID-19 virus, uh, that, that's, it's going to be interesting to see how they handle those things. But it does seem like it's not like they're just bringing everyone back without any precautions. There's definitely going to be measures taken. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting that uh, we're going to get back in the swing of uh, football and things are starting to open up, uh, not just athletics, but, you know, in general across the country. And you should be in Ohio State. What a year you had last year. But before we get into that year, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2018, you know, you're going through a scandalous season where Urban Meyer is being under media attack for, um, you know, allowing a previous coach to, or a current coach, to go ahead and engage in domestic violence. And basically people saying, uh, you know, he didn't handle it correctly and so on. You know, come 2018, when Urban Meyer finally retires or whatever you want to call it, did you ever expect the following season to be as successful as it was? I don't think, I think anyone who says yes is, is just flat out lying, uh, or lying to themselves. Uh, I have a tremendous respect for Ryan Day. He was on the staff before, and, you know, I got to know him a little bit over the two years he was on staff, and, you know, it, there was no doubt he was going to be a successful head coach, but when you talk about Urban Meyer, who's arguably uh, the greatest college coach of all time, him, Nick Saban, obviously Bear Bryant, Woody Hayes, there's a bunch of guys you can put in that group, but he's no doubt one of the best college coaches of all time. He won national championships at Florida and Ohio State, um, numerous conference championships, a tremendous recruiter. And so to expect, even like, to, to say that there would be little to no drop off, I think everyone's lying to themselves. I think everyone was nervous about it. But what Ryan Day was able to do, bringing in Justin Fields, um, kind of rehauling the whole defensive staff and making sure that the defense was set right, uh, just not even missing a beat on the recruiting trail. It's been absolutely incredible to see. And, you know, for me, I'm someone who's usually, I don't want to say pessimistic about Ohio State's chances, but I would say realistic. I don't ever really predict them to win a national championship or go undefeated. But uh, to me, the year they had last year was incredible, and it sets up to this year, for me, expectations that it's national championship or bust. Uh, in 2020. So let me ask you this. Ryan Day comes in last year. I believe if I'm, I'm going off the top of my head now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think overall the team ended up 13-1, and one, and I think they were undefeated in the Big Ten. I think they were like 9-0. Oh. I think they played nine games. Um, you people, some people are going to always say, and you know this, you've been around long enough, Alex, that he was working with Urban Meyer's team. But from what you're just telling me, and I agree with you actually, is that he did a lot of stuff on his own to really make that team successful. It wasn't all just being handed to him from Urban Meyer, was it? No, absolutely. And like, to pretend the cupboard is there, you know, that would be ignorant as well. I mean, obviously Urban Meyer and his staff, and Ryan Day being a part of that, they brought in a ton of talent. and but, but I don't think that's any different than if you look at Ohio State over time. They've always had talent. But what happened with Earl Bruce? I mean, he was a very good coach, but he wasn't completely dominant. What happened with John Cooper, another very good coach? He couldn't get over the Michigan hump and win conference titles. 
But then you bring in Jim Trestle, and, you know, a lot of the same players, he was w- able to win a championship in year two. The year before Urban Meyer got there, a lot of the same players, that team went 6-7. and seven. He goes 12-0 and 0 in his first year. And so I think what Ryan Day was able to do is kind of put his stamp on this team. He could have handled uh, things, uh, you know, very similar to Urban as far as the culture and the way he acts and all, you know, the staff members. But he took it upon himself to put his own stamp on the program, whether that's, you know, his personality and having that reflected on the team, whether that was making decisions to completely rehaul the defensive staff other than Larry Johnson and bring in his own guys and his own vision of how the defense should be operated, whether that was going out and getting Justin Fields because he felt that the talent in the quarterback room wasn't fit to run his system. He made all of those decisions, and that is what led, I think, to Ohio State having as much success, not only as they had last year, but putting them in a position to have success moving forward as he continues to kind of put his stamp on this program uh, and not just ride Urban's coattails. Now, in 2020, and we'll only project, and of course, I mean, Ohio State, once again, is going to be a powerhouse. Um, do you see this team being a team that has what it takes to actually get over the hump this year and make it to the national championship? I do. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I, I think it's national championship or bust this year. You have a lot of your pieces, especially on the offensive side of the ball back, led by Justin Fields. Football is, you know, is a game where if you don't have a, a quarterback who can get the job done, especially in college football, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to do it. And I think Ohio State, you know, obviously Trevor Lawrence, tremendous talent, but, uh, and I would have him above Fields right now, but if Ohio State is one of the top two quarterbacks in college football in Justin Fields, and as long as he stays healthy, I think they're going to have a great chance. Sure, there are some things where they have to retool and reload, but again, you know, I think they have the talent, I think they have the coaching, and I think uh, the defense is going to be good again, really good again. Uh, I think uh, on the offensive side of the ball, they're, you know, they, they did lose some talent, but, you know, the, the guys they have uh, replacing a few of the guys that left or went to the NFL, um, it, 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 it's top-notch. So there are really no concerns on my part. And I think the way the Clemson game played out last year, it's definitely given this team a little bit of fuel throughout the offseason and motivation to make sure that they kind of do get over that, that little hump and, and make it back to the national championship game somewhere they haven't been since the 24th season. Now, obviously, Clemson's going to look good again this year with Trevor Lawrence. Do you see any – who do you see, maybe that's a better way of wording it, that puts a major threat on the possibility of Ohio State getting to that game this year? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, 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 uh, it's multi, multifaceted there. I think Clemson, for me, if I was going to pick right now, would be Ohio State and Clemson. Uh, competing for the national. Whoops. Let's see what happened. Are you there? I'm here. Okay, I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, anyway, as I was saying, Ohio State and Clemson uh, are my two picks for the two top teams. I think the SEC is a little interesting this year. You know, LSU, I think it's definitely going to take a big drop off after all the talent they lost. Uh, I think Florida could be pretty good. I think Georgia could be pretty good. I think Alabama will will be back and win the SEC West again. But I'm not sure any of those teams are as good as Ohio State or Clemson. And not to mention, uh, obviously, the schedule will, will, will certainly help a little bit. Uh, but but when you look at Ohio State's schedule, they, they are supposed to make a trip to Oregon, who does have a lot coming back, especially on defense. They're going to have a really good defense. Um, they, they lose Justin Herbert, but uh, they got a transfer from Boston College. Uh but I think can, can do a good job running their offense. So that's one game. And then, of course, I think at Penn State, which is supposed to be a night game, uh, a whiteout game, which is generally a very, very tough environment to play in. Who knows what that's going to look like with fans and, you know, the whole pandemic and things like that. But those are two kind of roadblocks during the season that, you know, I think Ohio State could potentially lose the Oregon game and still, you know, be fine. But the Penn State game could be a problem. I think the Nittany Lions are going to be pretty good. And, the winner of that game could be, you know, the team that ends up making the college football playoff out of the Big Ten this year. So I would say, uh, you know, that Penn State game and then, you know, potentially Clemson, those would be my two biggest teams that are a threat to Ohio State, uh, in my opinion, of making the national championship game. We're talking to Alex Liebman. He covers Ohio State and also Rutgers University. Before I let you go, Alex, because I know you have an appointment there today, 
I have to ask you this final question because I like to get everybody's opinion on this. College football currently has a four-team playoff. You hear mixed reviews about it, whether there should be more teams involved, maybe to an eight-team format. What is your belief on the current playoff system? And if you do not like it, what do you think should be done to alter it? Yeah, I'm fine with the current system. I, I, I am in favor of expansion, but I would never go more than eight teams. I think when you look at probably the top eight teams every year, even like the seventh and eighth team are, are kind of a stretch. Um, anything beyond that is, is a huge stretch to me. So I would either go with six or eight. If you go with six, it's, it, it still makes the regular season really important and playing for those top two spots to kind of get a bye. Um, I think if you go to eight, that's fine too, but the way I would reward um, the regular season performance and the seeding is by giving the top four teams home field advantage uh, in the first round. I think it would be really cool uh, to see a game in, you know, December where Ohio State is hosting, uh, I don't know, Georgia in, in Ohio Stadium, you know, making a southern team come up north. And it, it certainly would give, um, you know, performing better in the regular season an advantage over playing at a neutral field where the fans are split and things like that. And so if they go to eight, I, I think you have to do uh, home field advantage for the first four teams. I also would say all of the Power Five conference winners should be in the playoff, which makes, again, the regular season and the conference championships important. So you would have those five teams, and then I would have three wild cards uh, that a committee would, would be able to select, and they would see the whole – uh, eight teams. So then, you know, you could have a team like UCF in the past getting in as a wild card team. You could have two teams from a conference with one of them getting in as a wild card team. And I think, I think that was that is probably the most likely uh, scenario going to eight. But I also wouldn't, uh, you know, I, I would be in favor of potentially going to six with the first two teams having a bye. But uh, I think eight is definitely more likely. And, and I kind of like the, the home field advantage with the five power conference champions and then three wild cards. Alex, I want to thank you so, so very much for joining us on Frankly Speaking Sports today. Hopefully during the season when games start being played in front of crowds and stuff, love to have you back on where we can break down maybe some Ohio State football and Rutgers football as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, appreciate you having me on. Happy to come back anytime and hope everyone continues to stay safe and healthy out there. Yeah, you stay safe as well, my friend. All right, thanks. Thank you. That was Alex Gleeman. He's an insider for Ohio State at Buckeye Scoop, and he covers Rutgers University. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking Sports. Want to make sure and remind you that there are very many or a lot of different platforms that you can join us on. You can go to our beautiful new YouTube channel, watch all our videos, watch all of our interviews, our podcasts, and listen to the audio of all of them. You can follow us on Twitter, at Larry Frankis. Also, we have a Facebook page, Frankly Speaking Sports. Go to Facebook, look for the group, and become a member. All of these different platforms are free. And, of course, we are on Anchor FM, Spotify, Breaker, Google, and several other um, podcast pl pl platforms. So you're able to watch that as well. And I got some news out of the NBA about the teams, and I know we discussed this yesterday on uh, the different teams that are going to be going to Orlando, which is going to be announced today. And um, Adrian Wojnarowski is giving us the name of the teams. It looks like 13 teams from the Western Conference and nine teams from the Eastern Conference will be going. I'm not sure why they're taking 13 from the West and only 9 from the East rather than 11 and 11. I'm sure records have something to do with that. But real quickly, I'm going to break down the teams. In the Western Conference, the teams that would be going to Orlando to play would be the Los Angeles Lakers, Los Angeles Clippers, Denver Nuggets, Utah Jazz, Oklahoma City Thunder, Houston Rockets, Dallas Mavericks, Memphis Grizzlies, Portland Trailblazers, New Orleans Pelicans, Sacramento Kings, San Antonio Spurs, and the Phoenix Suns. 
That's from the Western Conference. From the Eastern Conference would be the Milwaukee Bucks, Toronto Raptors, Boston Celtics, Miami Heat, Indiana Pacers, Philadelphia 76ers, Brooklyn Nets, Orlando Magic, and the Washington Wizards. So, those would be the teams that would be going to Orlando when they resume the season in late July. And we'll get more information on that probably another hour and a half, two hours from now, once the conference call goes through with the NBA officials. So I'm really looking excited to go ahead and have the NBA back. A lot of talk now coming out that, you know, Major League Baseball may be coming back. Robert Manfred may be mandating a shorter season. They say there's a lot of optimism, but I'm learning from the past couple of weeks not to listen to any speculation when it comes to Major League Baseball because they are, always seems to find a way to disappoint us. And it really saddens me and disgusts me because they had a chance at a time where this country really needed them and needed a distraction. They had the opportunity to really, really flourish, and they failed. They failed. There's no other way to describe it. They had that opportunity. You know, we have COVID-19, so many people being affected. We had the George Floyd injustice that was done in Minneapolis, and now have protests all throughout the United States and the world. All of us needed a distraction. Not that we needed to miss the message, Please don't misinterpret that. The message is very clear what needs to be done going forward. But just something to take our minds off things for a couple of hours. And baseball had the opportunity to lead. Had the opportunity to shine. Had all this great opportunity. And when you look at all the responses throughout these teams in the NHL, the NBA, the NFL, and Major League Baseball, it seems like Major League Baseball is saying the least, doing the least, and not doing the least, excuse me, that's the wrong thing. You know, I know the Tampa Bay Rays in Tampa are doing a lot. And, you know, it's just that they had an opportunity to shine here, and they really failed. They, they really did. They tarnished it. Uh, they tarnished the game of baseball. People have a bad taste right now. And unless something is done very, very quickly within the next week, a lot of the fans that love baseball, especially like me, are just going to have such a sour taste in their mouth. They may not even care when it comes back. And I know I'll watch games when they come back. I'm a fan, but I'm still going to have that bad taste in my mouth. And if you haven't heard earlier today, as we were coming on the air, the NFL has sent a memo out to all 32 teams where coaches are now allowed to enter the facilities as of June 5th. That's big, big news right now in the NFL. This will be the first time in a while, I think since the beginning of March, where coaches have actually been allowed at the facilities uh, so a lot of catching up to do for these coaches, but that's a great, great sign, and I think in the next couple of weeks, you're going to see more of the players being allowed to the facilities as well. So once again, some great, great news out of the uh, NFL. So we've heard great news out of the NBA, great news out of the uh, NFL not so great news, which may not be surprising out of Major League Baseball. And yet, we're still waiting on the NHL. I told you yesterday, the NHL has approved, I will repeat, has approved a comeback to work. A comeback to work plan. They're just waiting on the government and the officials to give them the go-ahead. I'm not sure what the holdup in those specific areas are. I know there's about 12 different cities that they're choosing between. Two of those cities will be picked as hub cities and utilized for the playoff format 
that the NHL is gonna gonna use. So some great, great, great news right there um, out of sports in general. Also want to remind you that tomorrow, what a great day to have it. The NBA is going to make the announcement today. Tomorrow we are lucky to have Brandon Kravitz. He's in the zone, Sunshine State host on FM 96.9 The Game. He's Orlando Magic radio host as well as the program director for 96.9 The Game in Orlando. So we have a great, great guest, as we did today earlier with Alex Gleitman. We have Brandon Kravis. Believe me, we're going to have a lot to talk about tomorrow, the NBA, and one of those teams that are going to be in this uh, return to action format that the NBA is putting together is going to be the Orlando Magic. So we'll have a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the nine teams only from the East and the 13 teams from the West. We'll talk about the Orlando Magic being one of them, how he expects them to do in this playoff format that the NBA is seeking. So lots and lots of stuff tomorrow to get to. You know, and I'm getting memos here by the minute from different insiders that I deal with in different sports. And we talked about the NFL coaches being allowed back just seconds ago at the facility, as long as the state authorities allow it. So if you're currently in a state, and I don't know how many states are out there as far as under lockdown still and cannot go to the facilities. But if you're in one of the states that allows you to go to the facility, then the NFL coaches are allowed to do so. Also, if you're an Arkansas Razorback fan, I do not want to forget this. Uh, I believe it was late Tuesday that three-star Texas wide receiver Jaden Wilson has committed to Arkansas. I I believe that came up late Tuesday, but we did not announce that yesterday. We wanted to make sure it was final. I know California and UCLA were also finalists for Wilson. Um, And I believe Louisville, Nebraska, Missouri, Kansas, just to name a few. A lot of teams going after this young three-star Texas wide receiver, but he has committed Jaden Wilson to the University of Arkansas. Want to remind you all to make sure to tune in tomorrow as we will have Brandon Kravitz, the host, radio host of the Orlando Magic, joining us live. To you all, be safe out there, and we'll see you tomorrow on another episode of Frankly Speaking Sports.